Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing economic development in an ever-changing and increasingly global economy with special guest, Nathan Oley, President and CEO of the International Economic Development Council. So, Nathan, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see you, and, and I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Thanks for the opportunity to be with you today, Mark. I really appreciate it. So uh, I'll set you up, but I'm going to get out of your way uh, real fast. Uh, strong economic development is foundational to a strong civil society. I can't imagine a strong civil society with terrible economic development. So your work at IEDC is really about the economic side as a precursor and as a foundational uh, piece of, of civil society development. Could you talk about how you support your members, who your members are, sort of give us a sense of what IEDC does and who you serve? Yeah, so the International Economic Development Council, uh, or IDC, is the world's largest association for economic developers. And what that means is that we've got a little under 5,000 members globally, about 25 countries represented within that membership. And what we do is, is really provide service, tools, and resources to economic developers on the ground and to economic development organizations worldwide. We provide professional development opportunities, so both courses and certification programs for economic developers to further their own career, uh, as, as well as a, a second certification around entrepreneurship-led economic development, which I'm sure we can dive into a little bit more deeply later. But we also do a certification program for economic development organizations so that they have an understanding and idea of what are uh, the best practices for economic development organizations. How do you set yourself up to be as successful as possible? How do you convene folks in your region, in your community in the right way? And in, in the sense, we are here as a service to the economic development field. That is both thought leadership, things like webinars and content and resources that we're putting out. It is conferences where we're bringing people together and making sure we're building networking opportunities. It is conversations driving you know, the next generation of economic developers into this work, into the field, but also making sure that we're on the cutting edge of, of where economic development is going and that we can provide those tools and resources quite frankly, to be tailored to the needs of communities. So whether you're in a very small community or a large city, or if you're in Africa or the United States, that we can provide tools and resources that can be tailored to the needs of your community, of your region, to make sure that you can further your economic development goals. And in the end, the goal is to create good paying jobs to support families uh, in an equitable way so that families in any community across the world have these opportunities. Um, I have a question about these types of organizations, because organizations that are membership organizations that are basically uh, supporting its members, those organizations can sometimes become very traditionalist, uh, very hidebound. Um, the uh, board members tend to be the same board members who cycle through. Um, and you can end up with uh, these organizations being behind the curve until catastrophe hits and then they dissolve, they just kind of fall apart. In particular, a lot of these organizations have for decades uh, existed on publications that they sell and courses that don't change and um, and uh, lessons that that are that were shaped 20, 20 or even more years ago. How do you, as someone who runs this, ensures the balance between uh, taking what comes from the past that is still that is still valuable and still of, of, of real present uh, use and also innovating in a way, it's sort of like the creative destruction process where you, where you decide what you're going to discard so you make room for new uh, lessons and new approaches. How do you do that? How do you strike that balance? Well, I would say the fact that I'm even here in this seat speaks to the need to be doing that. So talk uh, about been, that. So I started here just about a year ago. Uh, so February of, of 2022, uh, I stepped into the seat and, and took over for my predecessor, Jeff Finkel, who had been here for 35 years. And Jeff is an institution in the economic development world. He built this organization, obviously, but also furthered the lives of, of a lot of economic developers from across the, the country and even across the world. But I think what, as Jeff went into retirement, the board really set out to, to think, okay, what what do we need to be doing as an organization? How do we continue to evolve? How do we serve not just economic development from the past 10 years and today, but quite frankly, the next 10 to 25 years. And what are the things that we need to be considering from an organizational standpoint, let alone the economic development standpoint to make sure that we're serving that? We're going through a strategic planning process right now. It's gonna help us lead into that, that evolution. And quite frankly, it might be a little bit of a revolution in economic development. 
I myself am not your more traditional economic developer. I've been doing economic development at the state and federal level for more than, than 20 years. And over the last five years was working exclusively in rural and tribal communities. And what my experience has shown is in an organization, you can never rest on your laurels. You can't think that you've got everything figured out and you constantly have to be evolving, especially as a membership association or a nonprofit. I, I probably consider myself a little bit of a nonprofit entrepreneur, someone that comes in, helps to drive some change and ensures that that the sustainability of an organization and quite frankly, whatever service you're trying to provide lives well beyond your tenure in the organization. And so we are going through that process right now. The last year, I spent a ton of time just listening, both to current members, to our board, um, but probably most importantly to folks that aren't members, that are in the economic development field, but maybe aren't as connected to IDC as they could have been, should be, uh, or, or may want to be in the future to learn why, why aren't they, they better engaged or what have we not just done right, but quite frankly, what have we done wrong and what, what well, do we need to do? And if you're talking to people who are not members, right, and you start to bring them into a tent, that changes the organization, right? It changes the organization, the board level, the membership constellations change, and then the priorities in response to those not members sort of meeting their needs, those, that they're going to be new programs, Right. Exactly right. It's part of the process. Uh, but we also, even well before I came here, the, the organization started some of this work. So three years ago, they started a new Racism and Economic Development Committee uh, as a part of the board uh, to really start to identify the historical inequities that might exist uh, in economic development in the past and what led to that, both acknowledging what, what those inequities were, but also starting to do better outreach, to, to work with communities that, that maybe had been left behind in the past, to, to figure out what measurement tools we need to use to understand how do we drive more equitable economic outcomes. And do that has been a, a do deep... work in, Excuse me for interrupting, but it's a very interesting topic. Do you also do work to figure out what opportunity we are leaving behind if we continue these, the, these, uh, these processes? Because it seems to me that that... For an organization like your like yours, there might be a justice piece, but you know, at the end of the day, you're trying to develop regions economically. You're trying to strengthen them economically. Is there a piece to this that is not about justice? It's just about dollars and cents as well. I think it's always it has a dollar and cents piece to it, right? I think I look at it from a lens when I talk equity. That doesn't just mean race. Doesn't necessarily just mean gender. It means place. It means size of community. It means region of the world. So when we're talking from a rural perspective, there's been a lot of rural communities that have been left behind. And what led to that? Right. Why did that happen? And where where do we? Why need do we to disinvest in our rural communities when they're feeding the world and ourselves? Right. Exactly right. Exactly right. And so a lot of our work is just that. How do we both recognize? what those inequities are and what led to them, but how do we make sure we don't continue to exacerbate them? And we put together a, 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 an equity and economic development playbook last January that we released. We are doing some uh, equity fellowships right now where we're embedding young people in this profession into communities that are distressed. Uh, and we're launching new programs to try and help accelerate some of this change. So when you, when you talked about, you know, doing your certifications and your courses and so on, what you're not doing is simply leaving it as the certificate that hangs on the wall. Really, the certificate is nothing. It's the content, it's the ability to take that knowledge and apply it locally in a way that is locally contextualized, right? Exactly right. Yep. So what kind, of, what kind of skills are you embedding in those communities and what kind of follow-up do you do as an organization to ensure that those people who now have taken your courses, taken your certifications, they're now in their communities, how do they share that knowledge and how do they, they get the, the support of fellow members as they conduct their work? Well, that, that last piece that you mentioned, Mark, is incredibly important, that, that the support of other members and learning from one another. We, we spend a lot of time thinking about that and, and pulling together opportunities for that connectivity. What I will say is it, it's similar in many ways to teachers, where you, not only do you go get your degree, but you've got to right. you know, get continuing education credits. And so everyone who goes through this process also has a recertification process. And that means they're volunteering at conferences or events uh, to score other, other people that are going through the certification process, or they're going and doing a technical assistance visit in another community across the United States or, or elsewhere to help a community uh, address a certain issue that they've got a skill or expertise in. It is making sure that uh, they can take the knowledge that they've learned, translate it directly into their community, but also 
you know, we talk a lot about convening and collaborating and how do we build those connections? So it's not just your community that benefits, but your region and other communities around you. What are the biggest issues that are preventing communities from developing at the velocity that they are capable of developing in? I think the most fundamental issue is one of capacity. I think capacity, many communities... Meaning, you, you mean knowledge or people power or a combination of, uh, of things or, or collaborations or it's, what? It's, it's people power, it's knowledge, it's tools and resources. So I'll give you an example. We've got all this, all these federal resources that are available through, through states right now and obviously through the federal government. Right. And there are many communities that are not even thinking about accessing them because number one, they don't know about it. Number two, they don't know how to access it and they don't necessarily have the capacity or skills or expertise to fill out an application to be successful in securing those funds, let alone the reporting and other things that come with implementation. I don't think we did a good enough job 10 years ago to prepare these communities for this opportunity. And so what we're thinking about today is how do we prepare these communities today, not just to take advantage of what's happening today, but so that they're prepared in 10 years. So it's about capacity. It's about people power. It's about making sure that we're translating the knowledge and resources in a way that that fits local communities and the needs of those communities. And it's also about making sure that we are providing opportunity for the next generation to lead in these spaces, that it can't just be the same people doing the same work. Now, that example is about use of, of federal dollars. But what about local strengths and, lever- you know, maximally leveraging local strengths and even leveraging uh, local funding or, or relationships with nonprofits uh, for economic development? Uh, we're doing some work with the state of Colorado right now. Um, where the the, the uh, Office of Economic Development and International Trade is connecting with cultural institutions to ensure that the state of Colorado attracts creatives and creates this, this phenomenal place all across the state, rural, urban, so a lot of the topics that you're talking about, but that's really about art and cultural experiences that, will, that are attractive to families. How do you look at, uh, at, at those types of issues? In well, terms- of advancing um, economic development beyond the use of federal dollars, but instead looking at local strengths. Yeah, well, I think that that's where it has to start. It has to start locally. You have to you have to focus on the assets a community has and how can you leverage and utilize those assets in the right way, build a plan around those. But it's also a recognition that economic development is changing, that it's not just about the economic developer. It's about the folks working on infrastructure projects. It's about the folks working on housing, it's folks working on broadband or on workforce development. How do all these things align? How do we convene conversations together and show up at one another's tables? But how do we make sure that we can tailor approaches based on those assets locally, whether that is working with other nonprofits or or local foundations that might exist? How do we leverage the business community in those areas? How do we leverage organizations uh, that are helping to manage coalitions of of organizations? So it it all depends on what the opportunities are locally, and then you have to tailor the strategy to fit those needs. So let me give you an example of of an individual problem. Then I'd like to get to the international in your your title, International Economic Development Council. But I'd like to uh, continue with the U.S.-based example, and that's the one in Scottsdale. There was just a uh, recent coverage in the media of a whole Scottsdale community, which, because it is in an unincorporated uh, uh, land area, um, their water has been shut off. And now you've got this whole community. It's, it's a built environment, roads, houses, shopping centers, and so on and so forth. No water, which means that it might end up First of all, a lot of people are going to lose a lot. That whole area will become blighted or could become blighted. They have to find a solution, and there's no easy solution because there's no water yeah. to, to, to provide. Um, is How do you provide guidance to your members or provide service to your members to prevent such a catastrophic series of urban planning decisions which do not take into account what's really going on, you know, in this particular case, it was climate, but also just sort of not looking at facts on the ground, trying to manifest facts that aren't going to come true. Um, how do you help your your constituents um, ensure that money that is spent on economic development actually can gain traction for 100 years as opposed to, you know, 10 years and then, you know, catastrophe? Yeah, well, I, I'm glad you bring this example up because before I came to IDC, I was running an organization 
focused on rural and tribal communities. We did a lot of work on water, a lot of work on economic development and entrepreneurship. And the connectivity between water access, for example, and economic prosperity is something that is wholly under, not misunderstood, not just here in the United States, but, but globally. And I'll give you a little bit. Particularly in the West in the United States, but globally, yeah. I mean, basically, as, as soon as you get away from the coasts or, or from the mountain regions, you are, the water is an issue. It is. And just to give a little context, here in the United States, for example, there are 1.8 million Americans without access to safe drinking water. There are 150,000 public water systems across the United States. 97% of those cover communities of 10,000 or less in population. 150,000? 150,000 public water systems. 97% cover communities wow. of 10,000 or less in population. And historically, water services are, are supported by the dollars you you draw from from the households that are drawing water, right? So if you're in a population that's really low, 500 people or 1,000 people, it's really difficult to make million dollar infrastructure improvements and and put that on the the tax base. So what we need to think about is the connectivity between water access, economic development, housing, but we also need to think about how we can't just rely on ourselves and our own community. We've gotta be collaborating and building partnerships with those around us. Regionalization is a huge piece when it comes to this because whether you're in unincorporated areas or really small communities or even places like Jackson, Mississippi that are dealing with these complex issues, if you're solely relying on yourself and not working with your neighbors, it makes these, it compounds the issue. And so we've got to be thinking about how do we drive more collaboration, not just in economic development, but in infrastructure and other conversations. So this is so, this is so interesting. We could, we could talk about these topics forever, right? But I'd like to get on to this, this other aspect of the organization, the international side. Um, talk a little bit about the 25 countries beyond the United States, or 24 countries beyond the United States who are part of your, your membership, and talk about the past relationships that you had with those countries and your constituents had um, uh, amongst themselves and the future uh, relationship that you hope to cultivate over the next 10 or 15 years. Yeah, a lot of our international work has been based on relationships we've built with other economic development organizations uh, in different parts of the world. So whether that is the economic development groups in Canada, whether it is URADA in the EU, whether it is EDA Australia, uh, we've built those relationships to, to both create opportunities to, for synergies across our organizations, but also obviously to reach out to individuals and organizations in those countries and in those parts of the world. I think we, over the course of the next few years, are going to spend a, a great deal more amount of time building those relationships and being very intentional about how we go about doing that. I'll give you a great example. We, we just built this partnership with the America's Competitiveness Exchange. It's a program that brings together countries from across the United States and North America, Central America, and South America. And twice a year, they do an exchange program where they bring 50 leaders from across those countries to explore and, and understand economic development and entrepreneurship and innovation work that's happening in different countries. So in, in this past fall, I went down to Ecuador with a group of, of 50 other folks where we were learning what was happening in Ecuador and the companies that were being driven and the, the entrepreneurship and innovation. And, you know, so are you, now, are you now a student being instructed by people who are smarter than you in their of area? Of course, every day. Absolutely. It is, you know, it's incredible to go and see the work firsthand, but also to understand the complexities that exist in different environments of the world. And so I think that's just one example of how do we start to build relationships and learn, not just, you know, bring the resources we have, but learn from others and be able to, to find ways to build partnerships, create resources that can be tailored to the needs of those communities, but also take lessons back from those regions of the world to, to, to make our work better. Are you thinking about collaborations where uh, organization to organization, you can serve each of your members in terms of, of gaining exposure in the other's country? So those, those members in those countries or in those regions, those continents, can actually, um, you know, benefit from from the kinds of uh, exposure to your members' experiences in the United States, and vice versa. Absolutely, it's it's imperative for us to do it in that way because number one, we're learning from one another. We're creating opportunities for those individuals and organizations to be a part of something that's bigger than just what they they're normally a part of. And so, we're when we host our our major conferences here in the United States or even in Canada. We're inviting them to be a part of it, but we're also going there and learning from them. So I was in Brussels last spring. I was in South America this fall. I'm going to be in Australia later this year. So it's it's about building those relationships, but also 
being there and being present and creating opportunities for one another. So when you have your, so you have gatherings, you also have a Zoom or or the equivalent meetings and, and you're giving courses and so on. Um, you're, do you have an annual gathering or twice annual gathering? How, how does that actually work? And, and what other kinds of interactive um, uh, meetings do you have and, and what form do they take? So right now we have three conferences that we do a year. Actually, next week, late, late January here, we're going to be in Tucson, Arizona for what we call our Leadership Summit, which is focused on kind of the leadership of economic development organizations and how do we continue to, to make them more dynamic and innovative. In June, we host what's called the Economic Future Forum. And this year, it's going to be in Calgary, uh, up in Canada, where we're talking about uh, emerging trends in economic development and really trying to push the conversation forward on, on the next generation of economic development. And then in the fall, uh, we always have our annual conference, which is our biggest conference, where we've got 1,500 economic developers from across the world to come together. We'll be in Dallas this year, this September. Uh, and that's an opportunity for us to, to both bring the field together and you know, have really dynamic conversations about what's happening, what are we learning from one another, but also to create those synergies and opportunities for networking, people to connect with one another, to learn from one another, and, and really to try and help accelerate and build a bridge between the new generation of economic developers and, and those folks that have been doing this for decades. Do you end up also um, bringing in uh, 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 people who are in the government sector, as well as uh, people in the corporate sector. So I'm thinking, for example, Atlanta, if you take a look at, at the airlines that are based in Atlanta or uh, Coca-Cola or um, other uh, dominant industries in particular regions, I mean, we have a regional um, uh, sort of, the, the world is cut into regions where certain, you know, Detroit with automotive and, and so on, although Detroit is also uh, shifting considerably to medical technology. Um, how do you how do you function in a way that not only uh, brings your your members who are economic developers in there, but also are learning from membership organizations that are quite different, have different interests, but intersectional interests? Yeah, the interesting part about our membership is it is a really diverse set of types of organizations. So we have uh, federal, state or local government officials. We have or county elected officials. We have true economic development organizations, nonprofit organizations. We've got utilities. We've got corporate uh, partners that are that are doing this work, just like you talked about. And international and so, NGOs, you were talking exactly about. Exactly right. So the secret sauce is really how do we bring those folks together and make sure, number one, that they're talking to one another, but also that they can learn from, from similar organizations as well. And so our conversations are at least – what we try to do is make sure those conversations have a diversity of, of type of organization, a diversity of topic that we're talking about, but also how do we facilitate conversations even outside of the sessions themselves to really bring those groups together. Interesting. Interesting. So we're coming to the end of our time, Nathan. Um, what is the thing that you want people to go away with remembering about your organization and where you're headed um, and the kind of impact that that you wish to have on this th this world of ours. So I think first and foremost, I'd want to just tell you that you're all welcome to come and have a conversation with me and with us. I'm constantly learning and will always constantly be learning. And I want to make sure that that we learn not just from the people that we see every day, but but quite frankly, those people that maybe have not connected with us in the past. I want to make sure that they they understand there's an open door here for really unique conversations and that we are going to be pushing hard to continue the evolution of economic development, that we're going to try and provide as many opportunities as possible for young people to get more engaged, to understand the service orientation of economic development and, and help us lead the future of economic development. And mostly, that we want to find new and unique ways to partner. And that, that looks and feels very different in, in different situations. But we want to create partnerships that are going to not just help and serve our members and the economic development field, but are also going to support other organizations. So you want to be undeniably useful to anyone who is trying to advance economic development. Is that is that your pitch? Absolutely. I mean, today's day and age, if, if nothing else, COVID has taught us that we are all interconnected, whether it's infrastructure, workforce development, housing, economic development, community development, all of these things are interconnected. And if we're not willing both to invite people to our conversations, but also show up to their conversations, then we're doing our communities a disservice. And listening, listening, being it, being informed, evolving your, your processes. 
Do you have any new programs, Nathan, that you'd like to draw attention to? Uh, anything that you that you view as particularly innovative or particular of particular value to your membership? Yeah, we're launching a new program called the Economic Recovery Corps. And the focus of this program is, is twofold. One, to help create capacity, as we talked about earlier in the conversation, in distressed communities. That could be rural, could be tribal, could be, could be urban, but a focus on areas that, that don't have the capacity to, to really move their economic development efforts forward. And two, to help create a pipeline of the next generation of economic developers. So we're going to be creating an economic recovery core program where we're going to embed at least 65 fellows directly in distressed communities into host organizations across the map here in the United States to help build capacity for up to three years uh, where we will fully fund them for the community. Uh, and the host organization will simply need to be there to be able to, to provide support to that individual, to help them convene stakeholders in their region, and obviously, you know, give them some, some autonomy to, to help really build out their economic development efforts. There will be at least 65, certainly could be more that we're launching. The hope is to open the application period in the summer of 2023 and have folks embedded directly in communities in the fall of 2023. And so we're really excited about this opportunity, not just to help communities build capacity and not just to build that pipeline of economic developers for the future, but also to really set the stage for this future evolution of economic development and to be at the forefront of, of pushing these, these opportunities. So how do how are these uh, projects defined and how is the funding how does the funding work for these fellowships because that's going to be quite expensive. So we were able to get a, a very large grant in partnership with the Economic Development Administration to launch this program. We built a partnership with the National Association of Counties, the National Association of Development Organizations, the National League of Cities, the International City and County Managers Association, the Regional Accelerator and Innovation Network, and the Center on Rural Innovation to partner with us to actually manage these fellows. So if you're embedded in the county government, you're going to have six or seven folks that are embedded in other county governments across the country. And the National Association of Counties will help kind of manage that cohort of folks. If you're in uh, a, a rural entrepreneur support organization, the Center on Rural Innovation is going to help support that cohort. And we're going to provide training and tools and resources for every one of the fellows. So they're going to get all of our training courses from the IDC. They're going to have an opportunity to go after certification if, if they desire. We're going to help the organizations that are hosting them go through our uh, accredited economic development organization program. And so the goal is to create these partnerships that are going to accelerate the opportunities for the individuals and obviously for the organizations that they're supporting. So no government bureaucracy is being built. Instead, you're you're taking advantage of some funding to create a response, which will scale up. Um, you will provide the economic development support. You'll do a lot of piloting of, of ideas that communities develop for themselves. And then as, as you contract, you're leaving talent in those different areas who have benefited from that experience, but they're going to be local, they're going to be functioning locally, and they're going to be developing solutions over the next decades that are local solutions and not necessarily centrally dictated ones. Exactly right. And the other piece of that that we talked about earlier is the connectivity among them. So we're creating opportunities for them to collaborate with one another, to learn from one another from their own experiences that are happening. The goal is, is that this is not a one-time thing, that we're able to continue this and, and launch additional cohorts of fellows over the coming years. But this is the, the initial phase of the project. Just a great, uh, a great example. Uh, Nathan Oley, President and CEO of the International Economic Development Council. Thank you so much for sharing the work of your organization and we wish you every success because your success is going to be our success. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity, Mark. It's been great to be with you and, and appreciate the platform and opportunity. Great, great. Thanks.